Everyone, remain calm. Yeah. Ooh, ah, that's how it always starts. And later there's running and screaming. Somebody talk to me! What is happening? Welcome to Jurassic World. You're listening to the Jurassic Park Podcast. You want to consult here or in my bungalow? <laughs> Hold on to your butt. Well, we're back. Hello, and Happy New Year. Welcome to the 32nd episode of the Jurassic Park Podcast. I'm your host, Brad Jost. And we're here to discuss all things Jurassic Park. In the first episode of 2016, we've got some fun news, an audio clip for you, and a big listener segment filled with your comments and questions. So why don't we start off 2016 right with a bit of Jurassic news from around the world. 18 minutes and your company catches up on 10 years of research. That's just me. These pictures were taken in hospital in Costa Rica 48 hours ago. I don't want to jump to any conclusions, but look. Boy, my head been right all the time. But today, I guarantee it. All right, well, you've all played Jurassic World the game on mobile devices, right? You know, there's so much to do within the parks, so much to upgrade, except most of that stuff costs money, and we typically stop upgrading. Well, one seven-year-old boy didn't stop upgrading, unbeknownst to his father. The boy spent close to $6,000 upgrading dinosaurs and more within the app. Now, this includes spending $2,200 in one hour's time. Luckily for the father, Apple refunded the money due to his son not realizing he was actually using real money within the app. So I guess the moral of the story is be careful on that app because you can spend a lot of money quickly. You can find a link to the article in the show notes. The holiday season was pretty good to Jurassic World. The digital version of the film within Amazon Video was one of the most popular sellers during the holiday. They noted customers purchased enough copies of Jurassic World to equal the height of more than 2,700 Tyrannosaurus Rex. Now that's pretty insane. So not only did the film do well in theaters, it continues to dominate in the home market as well. I wonder if the high sales had anything to do with how many people are considering Jurassic World a Christmas movie due to it being set in December and having one Christmas song early on in the film. So what do you think? Do you consider it a Christmas movie? I kind of do. Here's to a great holiday season that was filled with Jurassic Park goodness. Make sure to check out a link to the article in our show notes. (laughs) JurassicWorld.org revealed a new image of the dinosaur hybrid line, the next step from Hasbro in the Jurassic World toy line. The image revealed a new T-Rex hybrid with a green shade and some different patterns and spikes along the back. The problem with this hybrid that I see is we actually don't know what the hybrid is. It's called a Tyrannosaurus Rex on the box, but it's also labeled a hybrid, and we just don't know what hybrid it is. Um, I'm not overly impressed with the figure, but I'm hoping my mind changes when I see it in person. JurassicWorld.org also revealed a few other listings in name only. Let's check them out. We have a Jurassic World Alpha Cycle and Hybrid Raptor Pack, a Raptor 1 Growler, a Terraminus Growler, Dilophosaurus Growler, Armor Ankylosaurus, uh, Armor Indominus Rex, Spino Raptor, Stegoceratops, Carno Raptor, Dilophosaurus Rex, and a Tyrannosaurus Basher Biter. I'm really looking forward to the Dilophosaurus Rex and the Spino Raptor. Hopefully those ones look pretty awesome, and I really hope we get a sneak peek of the other ones sometime soon. You'll find a link to JurassicWorld.org's article in the show notes. This week, Variety uploaded a new video where they talked with Tim Alexander, the visual effects supervisor on Jurassic World. Take a listen to a few segments from the video for some cool details. Hey, 
For this film, we're really trying to be true to our roots. It was great coming on this film and actually working at ILM and having a lot of the masters and the people that actually worked on the original film still around. But then we wanted to take the Velociraptors somewhere else for this film. Glenn McIntosh, our animation supervisor, started experimenting with motion capture for the dinosaurs, and we found that it actually gave us a very unique and different look that we hadn't actually seen in the other films. Yeah, so that was actually one of the other massive challenges on the show, which was the creation of Jurassic World. We had really good artwork. And, you know, sort of my approach to this kind of thing is to take that artwork and then go and try to find a, a real location that we can actually film at and hopefully get the basis for this environment. So we started hunting for a lagoon that looked very similar to the Jurassic World Lagoon, and we couldn't find it. <laughs> so what we ended up doing was using Hanalei Bay on Kauai, which is actually just a half bay. And then on location, they actually built the main street. And anytime you see mountains around it, those are added as well, because the main street was actually built in New Orleans. And ultimately, we ended up coming up with a full live CG version of the whole park because we saw it from so many different angles during the film. The Indominus was certainly a tricky one. It's sort of the main character, or at least the, you know, the main CG character of the film. And so that with any main character like that, the design process goes on for a long time. Colin's main thing that he asked for from the Indominus was that she have multiple weapons. He wanted her to be able to attack in different ways. So the Indominus attacks with her arms. She attacks with her tail. She runs 35 miles an hour. So these are all things that we have to take into account for in the design so that when we then go to do the animation, she can actually do those things. The T-Rex that we see in Jurassic World is supposed to be the same actual animal that we saw in the first Jurassic Park. That's right. I mean, that's actually probably one of my favorite characters in the film is the T-Rex. I love the moment where she comes out of her pen and comes out onto the main street and the big fight ensues. It's awesome. In our design process for this, we actually had to kind of age her and try to make her feel like still strong, but older. On Jurassic World, we actually did a whole new thing where we actually built a full skeleton for each dinosaur and then a full muscle system for each dinosaur, and then put the skin on top of that. What that gave us was a much more realistic look to the muscles moving and the skin sliding on our dinosaurs. We actually employed motion capture technology, and we cast four uh, people at ILM as the Raptors. So anytime we needed a uh, performance from Blue, we'd call the same person down, and that person would do you know, the action for us. We had to have four Raptors, and they wanted to have unique characters to them, so by casting a particular person for each one, we were actually able to get the performances to be very consistent through the film. And one of the main things that, that we were getting from was a lot of like very nice fast twitches and, and uh, it gave the characters just a less of a keyframe feel to them. The Mosasaur is a, a real thing and it's massive. It's like 80 feet long or something like that. It was Colin trying to open up the world and really try to make it feel like this is a working theme park. And they have to have multiple exhibits and things for people to look at. And it's also our chance to do something new that wasn't in the previous films as well. Now, you definitely have to check out the video. It has some really cool moments. Variety did a great job with that one. So make sure to check out our show notes for a link to the video on Variety's website. Aren't you supposed to be a genius or something? I can't get Jurassic Park back online without Dennis Dendry. Incorporating all the latest technologies. We shouldn't be here. And there's five dinosaurs. How many Sarahs do you think are on this island? So today I have a great listener segment for you. Many people wrote in with some questions, others called in, and many of you responded to a question I threw out there on Twitter right before the new year. So let's start off with the emails. The first one comes from Storm. It says, Hi, just wanted to get a quick question in for you guys. If you think there would have been a way to redeem the Indominus Rex, what would you have done? Hello Storm, thank you so much for writing in, and I think this is an amazing question. Uh, is there a way to redeem the Indominus Rex? Well, let's look at the original Rex first. We all know what happened with her. She broke out of her paddock, destroyed a tour vehicle, nearly killed two kids. She bit in half and killed a pretty despicable character in Gennaro. Uh, almost killed Malcolm, chased down a jeep while trying to run it off the road. But somehow, she redeemed herself and has become one of the most loved characters in the entire series. She saved the characters from a most certain death by taking out the raptors and allowing the main characters to escape. So at that point, it's a pretty epic moment for the viewer, and she is fully redeemed at that moment. 
And I think it's really important to point out that she didn't kill any good-hearted or decent characters. Uh, I don't consider Gennaro decent or good-hearted. Um, but the Indominus, on the other hand, killed two people, you know, at her own paddock. Many ACU members uh, caused the, the Pterosaur breakout, which caused the deaths of, of Mizrani and many other guests on Main Street. And to top it all off, she nearly killed one of our favorite characters in the uh, original T-Rex. So, honestly, I'm not really sure there is much of a way to redeem the Indominus Rex at that point. You know, after having been responsible for so many deaths of decent people. Now, the only possible way of redemption could have been maybe before the final battle. Um, they would have had to make the Raptors the bad guys at that point again, nearly killing Owen, Claire, and the kids. And maybe the Indominus could have stepped in and, you know, but it would have been a identical rehash of the first film. You know, I, I don't think that's the uh, Indominus' style to kind of save the day like the original Rex did. Um, maybe in the sequel, Jurassic World, they'll um, recreate the Indominus for war and for battle. But I could see her demeanor being completely opposite of the original Irex. That would be kind of funny, you know, super calm, really nice and cuddly. Um, I think that would be the only way to redeem the creature. Now I'm just kind of rambling on. Uh, but anyway, thanks again for the question, Storm. That was really awesome. This next one is from Andrew. He says, Hey Brad, here is a little bit of Jurassic Park trivia you might find interesting. If you listen to the movie version of the end credits of Jurassic Park 3, when the orchestra plays the Jurassic Park theme, the trumpet players mess up. If you listen to the rest of the track, when the trombone players come in, they play their part right, but also play very loud, almost as if a way to tell the trumpet players that they are playing it wrong. Then the rest of the song, the trumpet gets it right. The funny thing is, if you look at the performers for the orchestra, the three trombone players played for all three Jurassic Park films. So I guess it's no wonder that they knew how to play the theme right. Hey Andrew, great email. And uh, I really had to dig into this one because I, I couldn't, at first I couldn't find the segment he was referring to. Um, he sent me the timestamp saying that the mistake was here. Now, if you listen closely, it sounds very different from the, the uh, original Jurassic Park soundtrack right here. All right, here's the JP3 again. And the Jurassic Park again. So I noticed in the actual film and credit suite, uh, you can hear that same mess up part three separate times. Here. Here. And finally, here. Now the thing that makes me assume that this is not a mistake is first off, that it is recorded and finalized. We heard it. It's on uh, a good recording here. so. That makes me think it's not a mistake. Um, secondly, that part is repeated three times in that track. Now, typically, if it's a mistake, you'd only hear it maybe once, but they re they continue repeating it, you know, time and time again. Um, so I'm not sure a mistake would occur like that three times in a row in a professional soundtrack. Now, what I think we are hearing is a variation of the theme that we all know. Uh, now, this is from the third movie. It's a different composer in Don Davis, and we've actually heard different variations throughout the series when it comes to the different Jurassic Park themes. I think another example of this would be from the same film. Uh, you hear this at the opening of Jurassic Park 3, and it's a variation of the original Jurassic Park theme. Take a listen. Now listen to the original theme. All right, here's the variation again. So, you know, I think it's just a variation of what we know. Now, I'm going to play an example for you because what I think he is doing is Instead of repeating the high note in that sequence like this, 
He's just repeating the second note like this. Do you hear the difference there? Here's the original version. The variation. The original. The variation. So do you see the difference? Yeah, it's it's definitely different, but for whatever reason, you know, it's a strange choice to change up the theme in that very, very slight way. You know, as you can see, it's only one note difference. Um, but an anyway, Andrew, I'm really glad you pointed that out, and I think it deserves a good answer. So hopefully we can get down to the bottom of it. Uh, Andrew also pointed out that this topic was brought up in an old JP Legacy podcast episode. So if you or anybody else knows where to find that specific episode, uh, let me know. I'd love to take a listen. Thanks again, Andrew. This next email is from T. Murphy. It looks like it's a follow-up to last week's email, so let's see what it says. Hello again. We discussed last week the transmission that was played on your podcast. I believe you're on the same channel as I am now. I've heard everything that you've heard in the past few days, and it's not a coincidence. You've heard of people picking up radio waves from the International Space Station, right? Well, this is in a similar vein. Keep listening and try not to miss a transmission. They may need your help. T. Murphy. Well, thanks, T. Murphy. Um, and I actually have heard about the space station radio signal. You know, it's a really cool tool, and I think it's something that's awesome for kids to learn about uh, the different transmissions and how uh, the space station works and getting into contact with those that are off our planet, which is really awesome. Um, as far as what channel I'm on, I don't even think I could tell you. Uh, I'm looking at it right now. Uh, I don't. I don't even know how to read it, really. Um, I didn't change any of the settings from the time I purchased it at the sale. Um, so I guess it's possible that we're on the same settings. Uh, but honestly, I haven't really heard much chatter in the past week as I haven't really been able to keep a full ear on it. Um, hopefully I get a better chance this week. Uh, anyway, your email was a bit ominous again, uh, but I'll stay tuned to see what the connection is. Thanks. This next email comes from Tom, following up from last week's episode. He says, Hi Brad, last week you asked what happened to the Brachiosaurus in Jurassic World. I'm sure they are still there, as you can hear them during the scenes with Claire and Owen in his bungalow. There's also a photo floating around the Jurassic World website that shows the Gyrosphere Valley Information Board and the outline of the dinosaurs you'll encounter. In the middle is the Brachiosaurus. Why we never see it, or why it's not featured on any merchandise, who knows? You also mentioned the raptor pen. Do you think it's likely that there was an actual enclosure? Seems crazy leaving a dangerous predator in a small pen right next to a busy, or would have been, busy visitor center. Great show. Keep up the good work. All the best, Tom. Hey, Tom. Thanks for listening and reporting back on the Brachiosaurus mystery. Uh, I actually did a bit of research and did come across that image that you said. Uh, actually, it wasn't too hard to find as it is directly on the Jurassic World website. Now, it, like you said, if you go to the gyrosphere section of the website and uh, you click through the pictures, you'll see it. Just like you said, it features the Brachiosaurus on the map, which is used at the Gyrosphere ride as a bit of directions for the riders. Now, it's not something that we see in the film, but it is on the website, so that counts, right? Also, another inconsistency I found uh, was that the gyrosphere portion of the website says you'll come across 30 species on the ride. Now, that is very different than the 18 dinosaurs we actually see listed on Jurassic World's website, and even more different than the 11 assets that were on the uh, Mizrani Terminal. So while you push me to look into it further, Tom, I now feel even more confused than I was before. Now, I believe we mentioned the, uh, the concept art or storyboards in the last episode pertaining to the Brachiosaurus. Um, there's actually a few awesome images floating around. Um, one of them has a truck full of guests driving into Brachio Valley, um, also driving down, uh, not into a water, but into kind of a water viewing area where you'll spot a few uh, Brachiosaurus heads, uh, I guess taking a drink. Um, also a shot of a viewing pod, which is really high up about the, the height of a Brachiosaurus head. Um, and it actually has a, a feeder attached, which is really cool. Um, so it looks like they intended to include the Brachiosaurus at some point, but didn't include them for whatever reason, um, unless they did it subtly in the bungalow scene. Now, I noticed uh, a similar sounding dinosaur in that scene, like you did. I couldn't tell if it was actually them, but we can hope, right? 
As for the Raptor pen, uh, after watching the movie again this weekend, I was putting two and two together, and, you know, we all know who the big one is. You know, the Raptor that was moved into the pen near the visitor's center at the very start of the film. Um, so obviously that's a trigger right there. We can see that they're holding the Raptor somewhere else and bringing them towards where the visitor center is in that small holding pen. Um, and especially after recording the park map episode, I've kind of got a keen eye on where things should be located. Um, and in the movie, we get that scene where Nedry turns off the fences and the computers in the control room start to blink around each paddock uh, pertaining to which fences are down or still intact. Um, now, the blinking fences mean that they're compromised. And uh, we do see that the Raptor paddock is blinking on the map. Um, but we all know that the visitor center is on the left side of the island, not the right side where that paddock is flashing. Um, now, that, that's flashing over near where most of the dinosaurs are on the right side of the island. Um, but also, Muldoon asks, you know, if the raptor fences are down, but for the time being, they're still intact. So, um, uh, man, really, like before, like we said with the Brachiosaurus mystery, I'm yet again confused as to what fences are down, who's where, and... Oh, and we also find out via Grant that the raptors are roaming around the island with the raptor eggs there uh, laying on the ground. So, really, I guess we're to assume that he ended up in the raptor paddock, um, but who knows, really. This is all so confusing. Uh, I think we should just settle on the fact that the raptors uh, have a paddock, you know, over near the T-Rex paddock, um, and when the raptors started testing the fences, they moved them closer to the visitor center, um, because they're attacking those fences, and that wouldn't really be good for anybody. Hopefully that summed it up as best as I could. I don't know. Thanks, Tom. Uh, we also received a voicemail this week from Locust Sniper over on Twitter, and uh, he has a very good question for us, so let me play it for you now. Hey, Brad, this is um, Locust Sniper at J Justice Steel from Twitter. I was just... Uh, I thought about a topic I want to talk about, and there's been a lot of things... Um, I thought of regarding Jurassic Park, such as uh, what would they do in Jurassic World and stuff. But the topic I want to talk about the most that I've had trouble understanding is why do people hate the Lost World Jurassic Park? Now, for the longest time, I really didn't understand and, and really didn't know that people hated it too much until this year uh, when Jurassic World was you know, in the process of coming out people were discussing the original movies I was you know looking around all excited stuff and then I found out people actually a lot of people hated the movie um, and I really didn't understand it because I mean I've grew up, grown up most of my life watching Jurassic Park I've been a fan since 1999 and I've loved all the films though you could argue that Jurassic Park 3 is pretty bad in some way especially that horrible horrible dream sequence but The Lost World for me has been no, I love the first movie the most. I really, really love The Lost World. I don't know what it is. I, it may be Jeff Goldblum because he's just too awesome. But I love the dinosaurs and I love this, the how Steven Spielberg made it. Like the dinosaurs are free, they have their own places now. They're they're surviving on their own. And how they thought the T Rexes would abandon the young, but they actually defend them. And the amazing RV sequence where the RV's hanging over the cliff and uh, the scene where they're in the RV and the girl falls on the glass and it, it starts to break and that intense sequence there right before they fall, they catch her and the RV falls and just all the amazing stuff going on. And I'm just wanting to know why so many people hate Jurassic Park, The Lost World. If you can explain it to me, that would be really nice because I, I really don't get it. I think it's an absolute amazing movie. So that's my question. Why, why do people hate The Lost World? Thanks so much for calling into our voicemail line. Uh, I really love hearing from, from the listeners directly. Uh, first off, I agree with you totally. Uh, the Lost World is probably my second favorite of the four films. Um, it has some really, really amazing moments throughout the film. I really think Jeff Goldblum stands out, and he is convincing to me as the lead. Um, I love the soundtrack, uh, those intense moments like you pointed out, the RV. Uh, I really like San Diego. I like the long grass and just how, how dark the film is overall. Secondly, I actually pulled a few quotes from reviews for The Lost World uh, to try and find out why people didn't like it. Um, so here we go. Let's check them out. 
Critics have panned the film for lacking Spielberg's usual magic touch, but in awe of sorts persists. Nature retains a purity that people have lost. Narratively inept, unconvincingly edited, and nearly deficient of suspense. Readily the worst thing Steven Spielberg has ever made. The film is essentially a grab bag of sequences tied together by a minimal storyline that allows several abandoned scenes from the first book to reach the screen. If Jurassic Park reminds us of the magic Hollywood is capable of, the Lost World shows us how quickly we can get bored. With the low angle, out of focus, washed out photography, it looks like Spielberg slapped this thing together on his weekends away from DreamWorks. Where is the awe? Where is the sense that if dinosaurs really walked the earth, a film about them would be more than a monster movie. Where are the oohs and ahs? So really I think people had complaints about it being boring and missing that awe from the first film, but I really think that means that the main issue lies with the first film. Jurassic Park was so good that people were inevitably disappointed with The Lost World. You know, it was dark, it was scary, and yes, a monster movie, but I think, you know, Jurassic Park was as well. I don't really think The Lost World needed all that awe from the first film. Um, but, you know, who knows? Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, also, a lot of people had issues with Goldblum as the lead. Um, people found him better in a minimal role as a side character main, uh, rather than the main focus. I don't agree with that, but moving on. Many have been outspoken about the gymnastic sequence. You know, when Kelly kicks a raptor. Uh, yeah, it's not the best thing in the world. But they set it up earlier in the film, and it paid off, so, you know, I don't mind. Um, also, I think many people hated the ending in San Diego, uh, linking it too much to something along the lines of Godzilla or maybe even a sci-fi movie. Um, but, you know what, I really love the movie, and I'm not sure, I, I honestly can't say, aside from these things, which don't bother me, I can't say why people don't like this movie. And I think part of the problem is that they don't actually play it on TV very often. You know, time and time again, you see these Jurassic Park marathons on TV, like they were this past weekend, and they, they just can completely skip The Lost World. They'll play Jurassic Park, then Jurassic Park 3, then Jurassic Park, Jurassic Park 3, back and forth, without ever showing The Lost World. And I think that's part of the problem. But anyway, I don't really know. Hopefully people start to like it a little bit more in the future here, and maybe they'll actually start playing it on TV. I I'd love to see that again. Um, actually in full rotation with the other three movies. That would be great. Um, but thanks for sending in that voicemail, and hopefully we get to hear from you again soon. Now, I actually did get another voicemail this week, but it was a bit harder to understand, so uh, here it is. Hello. This is Lincoln Frost. A super fan of Jurassic Park. One big super fan. That is the opening theme song. First Jurassic Park film. I believe it was from Nathan, and it sounds like you're a huge Jurassic Park fan, but really that's about all I got. Um, hopefully you can call back in sometime, leave another message, because I'd really love to hear from you. Now the final bit of this listener segment here occurred right before the clock struck midnight on the 31st. I asked everybody what was your favorite Jurassic moment from 2015. I received a ton of great answers, so let's dive into them. One of our favorites here at Spaceman Spooky says, Finding all you people on Twitter. It really intensified my excitement for the movie and made some good friends here. This is the one that I 100% agree with. I think it's even better than having Jurassic World in our lives is finding all you awesome people that have been out there this whole time on Twitter, Instagram, wherever you may be. It's an amazing community and I think it's probably the best part of this whole experience. Josh at Nublar7 says, Thursday, June 11th at 7 p.m. The moment the 14 year wait between sequels ended for me. You know, this one is right up there at the top for me as well. Um, you know, witnessing Jurassic World after so long was an amazing experience. I'll never forget that moment. Um, it was so great to finally see this series come back to life after being gone for so long. And just knowing that we have it here for so much longer, you know, with the, the sequels and everything else that's revolving around this movie series, I see this going on for a very long time. And that was something that's very special after waiting so long. Nathan Allen says, Getting my Jeep built and finished in time for the Jurassic World premiere. At JW underscore Packy says, When I saw Jurassic World for the first time, 
From start to finish, the excitement I felt. I'll never forget that feeling. At Claire Grady 22 says, When I saw Jurassic World in the theater on June 11th at 14.20 p.m., one of the best experiences of my life. Billy Reed says, Finally seeing the 14-year-long hype train that was Jurassic Park 4 come to a fulfilling end was quite the satisfying time. At JW2 Director says, When I watched Jurassic World with my mom while drinking soda in my Raptor Squad cup at the movies. Goldblum for President says, Keeping up with all the Jurassic podcasts and speculating what Jurassic World had in store for us. Also loved the reading everyone's tweets when Colin posted a new Jurassic World picture or after a new trailer or TV spot was dropped. At N7 Patrick says, Seeing Jurassic World for the first time. Here's Storm again saying, Seeing Jurassic World in the theaters. It was the first time I'd seen a JP film while it was new in theaters. I may have cried. Victoria's Cantina says, The movie was the main event, of course, but also what came with it. Toys, the reviews, the people I got to know, all of it. You know what? I think 2016 has a lot to live up to, It was a great year for us, for all of us Jurassic Park fans. Um, And knowing that a new film won't hit until 2018 means news and excitement could be pretty slim for 2016. Hopefully we at least get some sort of news uh, about a director or uh, what kind of timeline we have in the film. Uh, But anyway, thank you so much to everybody for sending in your emails, your voicemails, or your responses via Twitter. You guys all make this a really, really great community. So thanks. Thanks for listening to the 32nd episode of the Jurassic Park Podcast. A big thanks to everybody who submitted emails, uh, responding to our online questions, and for calling in. It's so great to hear from you all each and every week. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. This is a fan podcast, you know, where we welcome all listeners to interact and be part of the show. So don't be afraid to write in or call our voicemail line. Now, we plan on doing even more great stuff in 2016. Uh, We have some great guests lined up, some awesome topics to discuss, and even more interaction planned for you guys in the new year. Stay tuned and keep making the Jurassic Park community one of the best film communities around. If you want to interact with us, we do most of our work over on Twitter, at Jurassic Park Pod, but we are also on Instagram as the Jurassic Park Podcast. Don't forget to check out our Flickr page as well. You can always listen to us via iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Podomatic, and YouTube. So make sure to subscribe. It really means a lot. We're usually spotted commenting on the Jurassic Park subreddit as Jurassic Park Podcast. All of the links to our web presence are in the show notes. Now, if you want to get a hold of us, you can email us, like everybody else did this week, with any news stories, MP3s, segment ideas, pictures, top tens, or comments to JurassicParkPod at gmail.com. If you'd like to record something for the show, send it in to us and we'll feature it in an upcoming episode. If you don't have any way to record, you can give our voicemail a call and leave us a message. That number is 732-825-7763. Thanks for listening, and enjoy. Five minutes. Drop what you're doing and leave now.